I want to welcome all of you here. I'm Catherine Frankie. I'm on the law faculty here, and um, we, we promise to have a really interesting and, and complex discussion or roundtable, really, on the um, developments in the International Criminal Court with respect to Israel-Palestine tonight. So thank you so much for coming and for joining us in this discussion. As you may know, the Palestinians acceded to the International Criminal Court in very early of uh, this year, in, in January. And shortly thereafter, the um, ICC prosecutor announced that she was initiating uh, or opening a preliminary investigation into possible war crimes <clears throat> that may have been committed, and that the, what follows is very important, in the occupied Palestinian territory, territory, including East Jerusalem, since June 13th, 2014. So there's a territorial and a temporal limitation to her investigation. Um, uh, and the consequences are, are quite important, both for, uh, for Israel and for Palestine and for human rights law and, and for the ICC itself. So um, I want to thank the Human Rights Institute, the Columbia Society for International Law, the Institute for the Study of Human Rights, and the Center for Palestine Studies in co-sponsoring this event tonight. Um, for those of you who are sitting on the floor, there's a seat here that a coat is occupying. There's another seat over here. Um, there's a couple of chairs over here that we could, we could disassemble, so uh, unless you're enjoying being on the floor, um, which is possible, or you don't want the attention of, that I've now drawn to you, um, <laughs> please, please feel free to, to come, come get a proper seat. So um, I, what I want to do is introduce our panelists, um, uh, and then uh, we'll each of, each of us speak for about 20 minutes, and then we're very uh, interested, in, of course, in your questions or comments on the presentation here tonight. So our first presenter is uh, uh, Lori Damrosh, my wonderful colleague, Professor Damrosh, who is the Hamilton Fish Professor of International Law and Diplomacy, and among her um, other activities outside of the law school, she is the president of the American Society for International Law uh, until April of next year, and a very important role that she's playing in the uh, international legal uh, community. She teaches here at Columbia courses in public international law, the Constitution, and U.S. foreign affairs, and subjects related to that, including enforcing international law, human rights, and international criminal tribunals. So she is our resident local expert on all of these issues. Um, uh, but she is also among the most distinguished scholars and teachers here at, at Columbia in New York. Um, I would also argue in the United States, if not globally, working on uh, human rights law, the law of war, and on the law of international criminal tribunals. So thank you for making time for us tonight, Professor Damrush. Um, next, uh, Klaus Kress will be speaking. He's a professor of criminal law and public international law at the University of Cologne, where he holds the chair for German and international criminal law and is the director of the Institute of International Peace and Security Law. He's also visiting this semester for a, a short period of time at Columbia Law School, and we're really delighted to have him here joining our community. Um, and so we'll be on our best behavior tonight for our visitor. Um, but we're making good use of him while he's visiting on panels such as this um, and, and joining this community. But in addition to being with us um, since 1998, he's been representing Germany in the negotiations regarding um, the ICC and was a member of the expert group on the German codes of crime under international law acted as the war crimes expert for the prosecutor general for East Timor, uh, was the head of the ICC's drafting committee for the regulations of the court, and was a uh, sub-coordinator in the negotiations on the crime of aggression. So he is a uh, preeminent internationally recognized scholar and legal actor, um, uh, legal expert in certainly the issues we're dealing with today. Um, next, Jamil Dakwar will speak. He's the director of the American Civil Liberties Union's Human Rights Program. Um, but prior to joining the ACLU in 2004, he worked at Human Rights Watch. And before moving to the United States, he was a senior attorney with Adala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Haifa, Israel. Um, in addition to his incredibly demanding job at the ACLU, he also is an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, we draw him on him frequently um, to come speak at Columbia, and even though he um, confesses to having gotten a master's degree in law at NYU, um, we do welcome him here at Columbia every time. Um, 
So lastly, I'm going to speak. I'll do some cleanup if there's anything less left to say. It's always a little odd to do your own introduction, but here you go. Um, I'm the Saltzbacher Professor of Law here at Columbia Law School, where I also, among other things, direct our Open University Project. It's a new project I founded here um, to encourage, enable, and defend university-based teaching, learning, and discussion of the history and the politics of Israel-Palestine uh, in a way where we learn from one another rather than fight with one another. Um, my teaching includes the Law of Occupation, which I'll be teaching in the fall, um, and I serve on the Executive Committee for the Center for Palestine Studies here at Columbia. So with no more ado, um, let me invite Professor Damrosh to begin the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Frankie. Um, we had a, a little uh, colloquy among uh, some of us in advance of this session about how to publicize the event and whether this was going to be legal or political or some of each. And I said, for my own part, I felt more comfortable talking about legal issues because that's what I do. Um, so I'm not going to take a political position. But the first thing that I want to say is that all law arises in a political context, and most law depends on political determinations by somebody. Um, indeed, in the International Law Casebook, of which I am now the co-editor and which a number of you in the room have used, it uh, begins with Lewis Henkin's words from his Hague Lectures, International Law, Politics, Values, and Functions, the very opening words, first of all, law is politics. So we are not going to avoid uh, politics even in my own um, mostly legal remarks. Um, and the International Criminal Court, like all courts and all institutions, operates within the framework of political judgments made by political actors, maybe no more and no, no less than other courts. Now I want to assert that the decisions of the International Criminal Court concerning the situation in Palestine are governed by law, but to some extent the answers to legal questions are going to turn on decisions that either have been or could be or have not yet been authoritatively made by political actors and political bodies. So I want to try to isolate some of those legal questions and see uh, to what extent does their outcome turn on political decisions that the ICC itself does not make but that some other body applying political and not legal criteria has to make first. So now I want to say a few things about the ICC itself. Um, what kind of a court is it? Is it a real court? Does it act independently, impartially, and objectively as all courts must, or is it an instrument of politics? So I want to assert and try to demonstrate that it is a court and that it is deserving of respect and that it draws legitimacy from its scrupulous adherence to the legal requirements of its jurisdiction. And I would say the same thing about that other body that sits in The Hague, the International Court of Justice. It's a real court, and it's perceived as a court and as a legitimate court to the extent that it adheres to the <laughs> jurisdictional requirements in its founding instrument. Now, first I want to place the ICC in its historical and political context, and then I will turn and ask some questions about the scope of its jurisdiction today. Now, for example, could the ICC just reach out and grab you or me, you know, tap one of us and say, you know, we prosecute you? Uh, could it investigate, say, uh, incidents of police brutality that have occurred in New York City in the past or that could occur in the future? And I put out this hypothetical because some might be speculating about whether it could. Legally speaking, I would say that there are easy answers to those questions. Uh, legally, I would say that's a pretty easy no. Um, but can it examine any or all of the incidents that have occurred or are occurring or could occur in the future in any of the territory uh, claimed as Palestine? And those are legally much more difficult questions. I will answer them with a resounding maybe. <laughs> so, okay, so what are the historical antecedents of the ICC. Basically, we have three big chapters in the history of international criminal jurisdiction. The first is going to be the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals that sat after World War II. And some of you know a lot about them. Everybody knows a little about them. If you know anything about them at all, you know that they are subject to what we're going to call the victor's justice critique. And then the second big 
um, chapter began about uh, half a century later. That's with the creation of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Again, some of you know quite a lot about them and some of you know a little, but if you know much uh, from a course in international law or otherwise, you would know or should know uh, that they were established by the Security Council without the consent and even in the case of Rwanda over the objection of the uh, state to whom that uh, court speaks. So um, against that background, we look at the negotiations for the International Criminal Court. Those negotiations spanned a half a century, and they were aimed at overcoming the objections, the you know, political but also legitimacy-based objections that had been addressed to the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals in chapter one and to the International criminal tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, the negotiations to create the ICC began right after Nuremberg. The 1948 Genocide Convention anticipates that there will be the establishment of an international penal tribunal with jurisdiction over the crime of genocide, but no such tribunal came into being. You have to get to the 1990s uh, before we had the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals created. They both had um, jurisdiction over genocide as well as other crimes. But finally, in 1998, at the conclusion of the Rome negotiations for the statute of the International Criminal Court, you had the framework laid for a new court that would come into being with um, jurisdiction over a small set of core crimes. So the Rome negotiations concluded in um, the summer of 1998, the Rome Statute entered into force in July of 2002. It encompassed 122 states' parties as of the end of 2014. And the negotiations at Rome more than 15 years ago were the result of a complex process of political bargaining aimed at, to some extent, overcoming the criticisms that had been made of uh, Nuremberg, Tokyo, Yugoslavia, and Rwanda. Um, the ICC negotiators were not like some ideal designer setting out to de you know, create the perfect body, um, but they did design a court. And I would like to talk about two key principles that um, are found in the Rome Statute. Maybe the precise words um, are a little bit uh, differently phrased, but one principle is going to be consent. So this is not a universal court. It does not apply to the whole world. It does not apply to every human being in the world. But somebody has to have consented in order for the jurisdiction of this uh, court to be properly seized. And the only exception to that um, is the possibility of Security Council referral. But that would apply in a relatively small set of cases. And most of the cases that should come and that have come to the court are there uh, by virtue of consent. Consent can be given in a couple of different ways, um, but in the absence of consent, you would need the Security Council referral. Now, the second big principle goes by the ungainly name of complementarity. The word complementarity is found in the preamble to the statute, and then um, it's elaborated in uh, a lot of verbiage under the heading of admissibility, mostly found in Article 17 of the statute. Now, I'm now going to talk like an international lawyer for a few minutes, and international lawyers talk in Latin, right? So they say things like jurisdiction, <coughs> diction, rationae materiae, rationae loci, rationae personae, and rationae temporae. Um, more colloquially, those would be the what, where, who, and when questions. You know, what is the subject matter jurisdiction of this court? It's material jurisdiction where, what territories um, are covered by it, who, what people are covered by it, and when, what is its time-based jurisdiction. So uh, I'll try to hit on each of those because in some sense they are all relevant to um, jurisdiction over the situation in Palestine. And then, time permitting, I would also address very briefly the two big questions under admissibility, which are um, complementarity and gravity. 
So, all right, first of all, subject matter jurisdiction. So in my hypothetical case, like, you stole my wallet. You know, that's not going to come to the ICC. Uh, there are four core crimes. Genocide, crimes against humanity, <coughs> war crimes, and aggression. And I'm going to assume uh, for present purposes that aggression is not going to be relevant to what we are talking about. We have the Kampala amendments that have defined the crime of aggression, but those amendments are not yet in force and it will be prospective only with many opt-outs and carve-outs. And so um, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes would be the subject matter jurisdiction that um, conceivably could be invoked, um, at least that's, you know, that's our starting proposition. So that, that's the material or subject matter jurisdiction, the what question. Now, um, on the where question, territory, the um, ICC statute has basically two main jurisdictional triggers. One of them pertains to territory and the other one um, pertains to nationality. So um, the territorial state, the state where the alleged crime occurred, um, may accept jurisdiction. It, uh, it may do so by becoming a state party to the Rome Statute. So notice that the word states is used. And um, so Article 12, Paragraph 2 refers to uh, acceptance of jurisdiction by states parties. And Article 12, Paragraph 3 provides for another form of consent under which a state that is not a party to the Rome Statute can accept with respect uh, to a situation. Now, territory is also relevant to the antecedent determination of statehood, because if you need a state, you need territory to have a state. We don't have such a thing in international law as a deterritorialized state. So in the classic criteria of international law, there are four of them. Unfortunately, you cannot take the, the proof of these four and go down to the licensing bureau and get the determination that you're a state, but the criteria as elucidated in uh, many international legal sources would be the state needs a defined territory, it needs a permanent population, that population needs to be under the control of its own government, and it has to have the capacity to engage in foreign relations. Now, Palestine and its proponents have claimed for a very long time that these cr criteria are met and have been met for a very long time, and you can check them all off, and there's a very plausible case to be made under each of of uh, the four criteria. And so let me just note that when Palestine attempted to invoke the jurisdiction of the court in um, 2009 and to make the declaration not to become a state party but to make the declaration under Article 12, Paragraph 3 accepting the court's jurisdiction as a non-party, the, the presupposition was that it had to be a state. And that uh, declaration sat at the prosecutor's office for several years until the former prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo, uh, shortly before he left office, issued a paper reaching the conclusion that the jurisdictional requirement of statehood had not been met. And that was not because Palestine wasn't necessarily a state. It was just because the authoritative determination had not yet been made by the proper political process that would affix that uh, seal of approval, so to speak. So um, Prosecutor Moreno Ocampo's paper said that the United Nations would be the one to make that determination. The um, state of Palestine had applied for UN membership, but the uh, UN political organs had not acted on that application as of that time. Um, he said it would be in the first instance for the Secretary General to consider this question, and in the case of doubt, the General Assembly would answer the question. And then he also suggested that the Assembly of States parties, that is to say the uh, now 122 states that constitute the Rome uh, body, could make that determination collectively, but they had not done so as of the date that he issued his paper on, I believe, April 3rd of 2012. 
Now that situation changed in November of 2012 because on November 29th, the UN General Assembly in Assembly Resolution 67-19 determined to grant to Palestine the status of a non-member observer state. And that is the status that it now enjoys and on which it relies in um, both acceding to the Rome Statute and in um, submitting a declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So I will assume for purposes of this discussion that as of now the statehood requirement has been authoritatively settled for purposes of the next procedural rounds at the ICC. Now, that's not to say that it's the end of the matter. I'm sure there is still a lot of litigating to be done before there will be a final judicial determination that the legal requirements of statehood and consent have been met. I do want to say um, just one word from the international law professor's point of view about the significance, if any, of the fact that Palestine has been accepted as a non-member observer state. I would say that it is not necessary to be a UN <coughs> member to participate in international treaties. It is not necessary to be a UN member to have a case at the International Court of Justice, for example, uh, nor to become a party to the uh, International Criminal Court. Switzerland litigated cases at the ICJ long before it was a UN member, and Palestine, um, I think in the contemplation of uh, international law, um, would not need to be a UN member in order to participate in this system. Now, territorial questions are going to continue to come up, however. Um, the 2009 declaration recognized jurisdiction, quote, on the territory of Palestine. The um, declaration that is now before the court, as Professor Frankie has quoted, accepts jurisdiction, quote, in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, since June 13th, 2014. That's the temporal part. We can pause uh, and ignore that one. But uh, these <coughs> words, in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, all entail questions that have a sort of mixed legal, factual, political character. And uh, you'll know, those of you who are familiar with um, the current docket of the US Supreme Court, that the US Supreme Court is hearing a case right now in which the position of the US executive branch is that sovereignty over Jerusalem is undetermined. And so this you know, contested assertion that uh, East Jerusalem is part of the occupied Palestinian territory would have to be um, processed and resolved somehow. Now, um, just quickly on the who factor on uh, nationality, because Article 12, paragraph 2B of the ICC statute also allows for jurisdiction on the part of the state of which the person accused of the crime is a national, and we will assume for purposes of the dis this discussion that most of the uh, nationals that um, Palestine would accuse of having committed crimes would be uh, nationals of Israel. Israel is not a state party to the ICC statute. It has, uh, similarly to the United States, signed but not ratified the statute and attempted to uh, you know, cast doubt cast doubt on its uh, signature uh, around the time that the court was coming into being in 2002. The relevance of um, Israeli um, competence as the state of nationality of potential accused in this case is the admissibility question. So this is where we move from the four big questions about jurisdiction to the two questions about complementarity, as to which I have only about less than one minute apiece. Um, two, yes, one minute on one minute on complementarity and one on gravity. So the idea of complementarity is that the ICC is not a court of first resort; it is a court of last resort. And so, if either the state of territoriality or the state of nationality is willing and able to investigate and prosecute the crimes and is either in the process of doing so or has already done so, then the ICC is not supposed to proceed. And indeed, the statute uses obligatory language. It says that the court shall determine that the case is inadmissible. 
in circumstances where a state that would have jurisdiction by virtue of territoriality or nationality is or has uh, either investigated or uh, prosecuted. Now, um, this complicated language on complementarity includes the words unwilling and unable. So, for example, in the situation of Libya, where Libya says we're ready, willing, and able to uh, investigate and prosecute the people of whom we have custody, this is a situation involving Security Council uh, referral, there's a bona fide question about willingness and ability. And here you would have, um, I'm sure, by our, our other panelists will be addressing this point, uh, a very significant debate about the willingness and ability of other actors, other states, um, to investigate and prosecute these um, allegations. The final factor is gravity. Gravity has come up already in an effort to bring the flotilla incident of uh, several years ago before the court. And, um, the Union of the Comoros, which is the state of registry of one of the vessels involved in the flotilla, attempted to um, seize the court by referring the case involving alleged crimes committed on the vessel of its registry to the court. And in November uh, 2014, the prosecutor's office issued a 61-page or so paper declining to proceed, saying that there was no reasonable basis to proceed and there's a very lengthy discussion of subject matter jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction, but on gravity, the prosecutor concluded that an isolated incident occurring on a single vessel or uh, several vessels involving a finite number of persons did not reach the gravity threshold. And there's about a dozen pages of that report that explain uh, how the prosecutor analyzes these uh, different elements of gravity. Now, the gravity of the events of last summer in uh, Gaza, in terms of order of magnitude quantitatively, as well as qualitatively, is very different from uh, the flotilla incident. So one could imagine a very different gravity analysis with a different outcome. I take no position on any of uh, these contested issues, which turn heavily on facts. And I look forward to what my fellow panelists have to say. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to reiterate to you, standees and cities, that there are a couple chairs here. There's one in the seat there. Um, we can have you sit over here if you'd like. So feel free to stand up and move um, if you would like a proper seat. <coughs> Professor Chris. <coughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. It's a wonderful privilege to be in this splendid university. I think that the proceedings uh, the ICC is now faced with the preliminary investigation the ICC prosecutor has just opened is probably uh, from a jurisdictional perspective the most challenging in the early history of this institution not necessarily from the substantive perspective but from the jurisdictional one and I shall explain this belief in four steps um, partially touched upon uh, by Professor Damrosch already and I shall be brief to the extent that I uh, agree with what she has said. I will touch upon the question of statehood first, the legal effect of the 12.3 declaration second, as admissibility issues third, and I shall conclude with a couple of remarks on the contextual element with regard to war crimes allegations because these will be decisive when it comes to the legal assessment of the, the recent, the last uh, round of Gaza hostilities. And I shall, <coughs> if time allows, uh, conclude with a very few general uh, observations. On statehood, this is indeed, as Professor Damrosch said, the overarching jurisdictional requirement because if the statehood premise fails, then neither the uh, accession declaration nor the 12.3 declaration can have any legal effect. So th this is of vital importance, uh, and here I essentially agree, uh, at least if I have understood her correctly, uh, that with all due respect to the importance of the position of the depository, 
the UN Secretary General of the Registry of the ICC, who is the recipient of the 12.3 Declaration, and even with all due respect to those states who have voted uh, in the United Nations General Assembly, it is my firm belief that the court will not be able to avoid to decide this question itself. So it is upon the prosecutor and it is finally upon the judges uh, to apply the international law criteria to the question of Palestinian statehood. Uh, I was never convinced and I continue not to be convinced by the position taken by the first prosecutor of the ICC who merely referred this uh, decision to the um, political bodies, be it the um, UN General Assembly or the Assembly of State Parties. This is not constitutive for statehood under international law and the court will have to make uh, what will be a very difficult uh, decision here and I personally uh, I am not at all convinced that the um, at least the third criteria of effectiveness uh, is so easily uh, fulfilled in the Palestinian case. So this will be a crucially important question because uh, obviously on uh, this answer will depend all what follows. And in a sense, what will follow now uh, are all legal considerations which are premised on the question that the ICC reaches the decision that Palestine qualifies as a state and, I should add, qualifies as a state whose territory extends to the Gaza Strip at the material time. This is a second uh, <coughs> question which might be uh, kept analytically distinct. The question of the 12.3 declaration is important um, under one, or is difficult under one legal aspect, and that's the question of uh, its retroactive effect or not. The whole purpose for Palestine to make this declaration under 12.3, in addition to its declaration of accession, is to give the ICC jurisdiction not just for the future, but also over uh, the recent round of Gaza hostilities <coughs> as from 13 June 2014. But this case depends on uh, the premise that Article 12.3 declarations have retroactive effect. This question has not yet been judicially fully tested. The texts, not just Article 12.3, but also Article 11.2, these are the two relevant provisions in the ICC statutes, are open, open to uh, interpretation. And I would argue that there is a fundamental, not just a technical question of interpretation, but a fundamental principle at stake here. Because if retroactive um, jurisdiction, retroactive legal effect is accepted, that would come into conflict with a fundamental principle that has guided us throughout the negotiations on the ICC statute and which has to do with the history of international criminal justice that <laughs> Professor Damrosch has referred to. Um, this new permanent international criminal court was devised with the ambition to no longer make it as vulnerable to criticisms of victor's justice, of selective justice, as prior experiments in international criminal justice. And why was this criticism? One major criticism was based on selective jurisdiction, on jurisdiction given after the facts, and not an open, equal um, application of jurisdiction pro futuro. If you allow in this exceptional case, Article 12.3 declarations for a <coughs> retroactive jurisdiction, you allow the entity, the state, which makes the declaration, in effect to pick and choose jurisdiction. Because it is then that state which defines, by virtue of its declaration uh, under 12.3, the boundaries of the court's jurisdiction. And this can easily be shown in this given case. It is no accident that the declaration under 12.3 begins as of 13 June 2014. Um, as far as I'm aware, the um, kidnapping of uh, some Israeli young people occurred before that date. And if this time frame would be strictly adhered to, 
then by devising the declaration as it was formulated, the entity making that declaration would have, so to speak, precluded the court from looking into what might be considered part of the conflict as a whole. And it was this overarching idea to give this new legal institution jurisdiction about, so to speak, comprehensive jurisdiction, fair jurisdiction, symmetrical jurisdiction. So this will be um, a very serious uh, problem for the ICC, the second problem that this court will have to consider once the question of statehood is decided in these proceedings. Admissibility. As Professor Damrosch said, two sub-requirements, complementarity and gravity. And I give, shall try to give you an idea how that will apply to the Hamas side on the one hand and to the Israeli side on the other. With respect to Hamas, I do not foresee serious obstacles uh, with that respect because as far as I'm aware, there are no national investigations. So complementarity is about primacy of national um, proceedings. There are no national investigations and there have not been, if I'm rightly correctly informed, uh, to a significant uh, extent about alleged war crimes by members of Hamas. So there would not be at this moment in time a complementarity issue here. And with respect to uh, gravity, I do not see an unsurmountable obstacle to consider a series of more than thousands uh, rocket attacks uh, on a civilian uh, population to meet that gravity standard. In fact, one would uh, probably uh, be in a position to argue, and the ICC will have to look into that matter as well, whether on top of war crime allegations there is also a, a case for uh, crimes against humanity with respect to this series of rocket attacks on civilian centers of uh, the Israeli state. The situation is quite different and much more difficult um, with respect to the Israeli side. Because as you may know, um, Israel has quite speedily, even during the Gaza operation, began by introducing national investigations. Israel has a military justice system. It might not be perfect, but I think it stands up the test in comparison with many other um, justice systems, including uh, that of my own state, uh, Germany. Um, there have been recommendations under the Turkey Commission's second report to enhance this system further. Some of these uh, recommendations have already been implemented. A fact-finding assessment mechanism is now in place. It is an, a very early phase of this investigation. I am not as an outsider in a position to judge the genuineness and the results. 13, I hear 13 cases have been referred to the criminal investigation state in Israel. But what matters from an admissibility perspective is that the ICC prosecutor will have, and this is a very tough challenge, will have to look into these Israeli investigations under the complementarity scheme and will, not something the prosecutor can decide now, but after a certain amount of time, will then have to reach a finding whether in her view the Israeli investigations into those cases of concern to the ICC um, fulfill the requirement of non-genuineness, so whether they di display the lack of a will genuinely to inv investigate those crimes. This is a high and a demanding threshold and states have deliberately made that threshold so high during the negotiations. With, uh, with respect to gravity, it should be noted that when it comes to war crimes, this gravity requirement is so to speak doubled because it's not just the general gravity requirement in Article 17, but there is a second so to speak, enhancing gravity requirement in Article 8.1, which also played a role in this flotilla incident decision you referred to, Professor Damrosch. And this, the, the over, if I simplify the idea, the key idea is here to have the prosecutor of the ICC focus not on single war crimes, alleged war crimes events, but on the idea of systematic war crimes commissions. So 
what the prosecutor would have to look for, basically, in the case of the Gaza hostilities is an Israeli policy to systematically commit war crimes. And if you then look into the war crimes list and look for that war crime which is most likely to be at the center of the proceedings, and that's the war crime of attacking in the expectation to cause disproportionate civilian casualties, this will, the, I think, the key war crime provision at stake. The challenge for the prosecutor here would be to establish an Israeli policy to that extent. One caveat, the situation is of course different with respect to another, another war crime in issue, and that's the thorny question of the Israeli settlements. Here, no complement, to my mind, no complementarity question arises because Israel is not, obviously not investigating uh, those uh, alleged war crimes. So here the prosecutor would face no difficulties in meeting the complementarity test. However, here you have a serious problem of temporal jurisdiction. The declaration of accession only has legal effect for the future. The 12.3 declaration, if you accept a retroactive effect, which is by no means, as I signaled it, a given, would only extend back until 13 June. So most of the settlements at stake would not be covered unless you resort to a very innovative and at least not before the ICC legally tested concept, which is that of continuing crimes, continuing criminality. And the argument would have to run as follows, basically, that all the settlements all the Israeli settlements, as these settlements continue until today, are continuing acts of criminality. But this, and uh, here I'm afraid I have to get a little bit technical, uh, this idea of continuing criminality or continuous crime will be again very, very difficult to make because if you look into the war crimes definition more precisely, you will see that the conduct that is criminalized is not the settlement as such, but the conduct is the act of transfer or indirect transfer, so the support to transfer by the occupying power. And here it is much more difficult to put it mildly to say that these acts of transferring are continuing until that date. So here again, extremely, and I'm just flagging the issues, extremely challenging uh, issues for the ICC prosecutor um, and the judges. And now the last uh, set of questions I want to allude to. Context elements of, or the context elements of the war crimes allegations. Two major questions will the ICC prosecutor and the judges be facing here. First, the one mentioned incidentally, by Professor Damrosch, was Gaza on 13 June and during the ongoing um, hostilities in a state of military occupation? Well, many political actors in the international community believe so, but from a legal perspective, this is all but clear after Israel's withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. Um, the court will have to look very carefully into what the ICJ, for example, has said in the armed activity case. There is dispute about the nuances uh, of what the ICJ has said here. Um, and here again, I am very doubtful whether it will be easy for the uh, ICC to go along with what is a widely held belief politically that the Gaza Strip at the, at the material time, it was still under Israeli occupation. That does not exclude, as the Supreme Court of Israel has said, that there are some continuing obligations, some selective continuous obligations from the law of military occupation, but that's quite different from saying Gaza in its entirety was militarily occupied. Even if it is, hold, it is held that a military occupation at the time prevailed, it will be far-fetched from your reality 
to deny that then coexisting with that military occupation, there was an armed conflict between Hamas and Israel. In a situation of so intense an exchange of hostilities to deny the existence of an armed conflict between the two parties uh, would, I think, uh, defy common sense. And that will lead uh, the ICC, the prosecutor, the chambers to the crucial question then, and that's the characterization of that armed conflict. And here again, you might say, well, that's a boring technical question of secondary interest. It might well be. And it is also true that over the last two decades, the law of non-international armed conflicts has assimilated to a great extent to that of the law of international armed conflict. But within the ICC statutes, Article 8, and this will be the exclusive basis for the ICC to exercise its jurisdiction upon, this distinction matters a lot. And it matters a lot with respect to the Gaza round of hostilities. Why? Because two of the war crimes in question, first, the one I mentioned, attacking in the expectation of causing disproportionate civilian casualties, and second, using human shields to, so to speak, protect military objectives. Those two war crimes the one very important for the Israeli side, the other very important for the Hamas side, they do not apply in a situation of non-international armed conflict. And so the decision what kind of conflict existed in June, July, August 2014 will, if all the other hurdles have been met, be of crucial importance. And how difficult the characterization is, you can gather from two not easily reconcilable statements of two important bodies in that respect. You have the Palmer's Commission report, November, I think, 2011, on Israel's imposition of a naval blockade. The Commission visibly found it difficult to make <coughs> the characterization in light of the uncertainty of Hamas legal status, and they said, for the purpose of the imposition of the naval blockade, we consider the conflict as international. You may call that diplomatic, elegant, but it also reveals the immense uncertainty, and the ICC will not be able to make such a fluid statement. The ICC prosecutor in her flotilla incident decision of November last year, she went the other way and said the conflict cannot be characterized as international because Hamas, Gaza not qualifying as a state at the material time. So here you see how difficult it will be also to decide this fourth question. Last remark, general remark, um, Israel, some Israeli politicians have reacted extremely critical when the ICC prosecutor opened the preliminary uh, investigation. And they have even, if I understood correctly, asked the German government and the Canadian government uh, to stop financing uh, the ICC. This, I think, shows how much distrust there is on the Israeli side in the possibility that international proceedings will act in a fair manner. And perhaps a certain amount of distrust in light of prior experiences is not unjustified. But still, I believe it is an unwise decision for Israeli politicians to take because it creates the impression as if Israel had legally already almost lost the case. It creates, from what I have explained so far, quite a contrary impression to what the legal reality is. The court, the court will be faced with an extremely daunting task in light of the immense political expectations that will lie or rest on him. And I think there is only one avenue for the court to pursue here 
it should not act, not try to act as a political mediator, not try to act as a diplomat. The court will have and must apply the law with all those stringent, you may call them boring and technical, all those stringent procedural thresholds that have been deliberately put in place when negotiating, negotiating the ICC statute that might cause short-term disappointment to some, but it is essential, I think, for the long-term legitimacy of this institution. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Catherine, for the introduction and for, uh, for hosting and for the organizing and co-sponsoring organizations. There's so much to, uh, to comment on and to say after these uh, very thorough and, um, and, and very interesting and, uh, uh, presentations. I'd like to start with maybe with the political and then go to the legal, uh, where, where things were left off. Uh, because I think it's important to set the, the, the context, the political context for, and the environment, the political environment under which um, the court is going to handle, ha going to, to grapple with these issues. Um, and I say that because I think there, we can, one cannot analyze or discuss the situation of the ICC now with, the, with regard to the, uh, the Palestine situation without looking at uh, the United States role in and relationship uh, to the court because I think ultimately it have, will have a decisive factor at least on a political level but also may have at least at the uh, legal uh, uh, analysis some, some sort of relevance to how things will, will, will play out uh, and, I, and I, I think I want to need to remind uh, the audience here of the the history of the United States with the court. Uh, the United States government um, uh, relationship evolved over the years uh, since the adoption of the Rome Statute in 1998. Uh, and it, in, 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 under the Bush administration, the Clinton administration first uh, <coughs> signed the, the Rome Statute in 2000. Uh, and there was a hope that that would be um, uh, showing U.S. commitment to issues of international justice. And yet, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the Bush administration uh, tried to, to, to do what the Israelis uh, have done, which is you know, something that is not really uh, clearly acceptable, which is to unsign uh, the treaty. Uh, but they, they did as disassociate themselves from the court, at least as far as what the Clinton administration tried to do in 2000 by adopting the Rome Statute. And not only that, they took a very hostile uh, position toward the court uh, in different ways. We don't have the time to go through all the details, but I would just want to mention a number of them because they are important. One is, uh, obviously, is to, uh, to say that uh, uh, we not only don't want to be party to this uh, court, we don't want our service members to be subject to the court's jurisdiction. And we would want to, to protect the US military personnel from its jurisdiction. And uh, having uh, a lot of uh, economic, diplomatic, uh, political power, the United States is in a position and was in a position at the time to put forward a, a number of actions, uh, mainly through an act of Congress, uh, which was called the, at the time, uh, the American Service Members Protection Act. Uh, under this act, the, the Bush administration, administration started to negotiate bilateral agreements, essentially uh, trying to protect its service members whenever they would travel uh, to these countries that would not be handed over to the, to the ICC. Uh, it had attached a number of conditions. Uh, first, it started with military assistance, meaning if the country would not sign these bilateral agreements, we, as the United States, would not provide military assistance to your country. And then it, it was uh, elevated to even economic aid, not just military assistance. And uh, this obviously has changed. Uh, the, there was a, uh, 
negative uh, or backlash toward this attitude. The United States has felt, and particularly the military establishment, felt that there was a lot of problem with that approach because a lot, number of countries that the United States needed their cooperation would not be in a position to help the United States abroad because of these agreements, because of these lack of agreements, meaning lack of military assistance, lack of ability to help, particularly post 9-11 world on counterterrorism issues. And so what ended up happening is that this military sending a signal that that's not a good idea. In fact, I think se uh, former Secretary Rice said, this is like shooting ourselves in the foot. And uh, at the same time, around that time, we're talking about shortly after the war in Iraq in 2004, 2005, uh, the United States was also grappling with the Darfur crisis and the humanitarian crisis there, and had to take a position whether it would support the referral of the Darfur situation to the ICC. At the time, it was a fresh court started in 2002, and one of the major humanitarian uh, situations that, uh, that erupted in Africa. And uh, so simultaneously, the US was kind of watering down its resistance to the court while at the same time showing its support to international criminal justice, particularly with Darfur, by abstaining. It did not veto the decision at the, national Secu at the Security Council uh, that uh, it referred the situation to the court, the Darfur situation. Now, that obviously showed, again, a selective approach. So we would support, in, uh, this is consistent with our US policy to support international <laughs> justice. We would want to see those uh, uh, who commit crimes uh, against humanity, war crimes, uh, would be held accountable. They, they, they had uh, clearly wanted to, to hold Saddam accountable. They wanted to hold um, other leaders, uh, including, of course, Al-Qaeda leaders for the atrocities of 9-11. But that said, uh, when it came to the issue of other uh, crime uh, 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 situations, other, cr other war crime situations, like in the Gaza situations, or where the United States itself uh, had, had found itself um, uh, responding to allegations of war crimes, particularly in the situation of Ga Afghanistan and Iraq, there, obviously, there, there is a different approach toward international criminal justice, and I think people can uh, understand why. So, while I think we 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 see that there is a, now a more constructive approach, especially by the Obama administration, and I'm fast forwarding, uh, where the Obama administration uh, basically uh, in, in engage with the court by uh, attending the the, uh, the ICC uh, assembly by uh, showing support even in, in contribution, in, in other kinds of cooperation, particularly around uh, some of the referrals in, in the situation of Libya, in, in I mentioned Darfur. Um, there has been certainly a constructive engagement between the current administration and the ICC. And I think it's not surprising that the, the comment of the State Department to the ICC prosecu prosecutor's action was not attacking the court which I think the United States understand it would be a terrible mistake to do. And I think uh, uh, it, 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 it went to the other direction of uh, challenging the question whether Palestine is a state. And it, in, its, uh, announced, in its statement, the State Department said, we strongly disagree with the ICC prosecutor's action. We do not believe Palestine is a state, uh, and paraphrasing here, and therefore not eligible to join the ICC. And then this is a quote, the place to resolve the differences between the parties is through direct negotiations, not unilateral actions by either side. We will continue to oppose actions against Israel at the ICC as counterproductive to the cause of peace, end quote. And I have to take issue with, with this particular statement because uh, maybe it might be legitimate to, to litigate and argue, debate about whether whether the General Assembly uh, decision uh, is right or wrong with regard to the recognition of Palestine as a state. But to put a statement that uh, seeking accountability and supporting uh, the fundamental principles of accountability is counter counterproductive to the cause of peace is, I think, uh, a, a very, very poor statement, uh, a regrettable one, in fact. And I think that is where uh, 
uh, I think want to connect to the remarks that were said before. The court, the ICC now is finding itself going to have to grapple with these issues of lack of accountability for war crimes and perhaps crimes against humanity because the different parties that were very close to the situation of Palestine-Israel, namely Israel first, and we'll, I will say something about its internal investigation process, Israel as the major party, which is the occupying power, I would take issue with the determination that the, West, the Gaza Strip is not, uh, is not an occupied territory. I don't think that, with all due respect, is the, the, the Paris Commission is, is the one to look at. I would, I would more look for the ICRC. I would look more for, for the other uh, elements uh, of de facto um, uh, control over uh, all of the territory in terms of access to, to Gaza by the air, by sea, by land. Uh, uh, registry, uh, all the things that really are critical for, for the well-being of the people in Gaza. And of course the blockade is, is one big policy that represents that kind of control. However, I think by neglecting the issue of accountability, uh, both internally within the State of Israel, over the years, and we're not talking about only the last and recent Gaza uh, uh, war operations in, in this last summer. We're talking about cast lead. We're talking about other military operations that happened. We're talking about uh, a whole series of uh, rights violations that have been taking place over many years. Now, of course, we would not want to put all of the all of these uh, uh, issues before the court. And I think it would be cert certainly from a from the jurisdictional point of view of the 2002 that would not even get into the door. But I think the failure of, of governments with the United States backing, uh, or at least submitting to this, this uh, unhelpful and futile proposition that and only through negotiations that you can, get, uh, uh, you can get justice, without even saying the word justice, is I think what we're leading us to the point where now the ICC have to grapple with these issues. I think that what's one of my concerns with the, with the situation is that the last thing you want to see is to have these issues litigated. I think the, the, there are some, certainly some role for, uh, for the law, for, for international law to decide on these fundamental issues, but ultimately um, there are responsibility for the international community. The European uh, Union and European countries, and for that matter other countries as well, have responsibilities before even the Rome Statute was adopted. The Geneva Conventions and the prohibition against some of the, the crimes that we are uh, now we are discuss, discussing that are consistent in terms of the pattern that we see in every war operation and every single war activity and did not start with 2000, uh, 1998 or 2002. They are, uh, uh, th these prohibitions and there are criminal, pros uh, criminal uh, prohibitions in place including under the Geneva Conventions. Uh, including, for example, in the United, Ki United Kingdom, where you have 1957 uh, Geneva Convention Act that uh, criminalizes grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. And under that act, several Israeli officials who attempted to visit with arrest warrants waiting for them were, were aborted because of the fact that there were uh, some people who did not want to see accountability taking place, not in Israel, not in, in other places. So I think. Thinking about the court now is, is essentially, uh, I think, unfair toward the court in, in, a, in, 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 a, in a sense because, uh, and I think that I take issue with that because I do, want, I do not want to see other avenues of justice to be closed because everybody will say, well, we have the ICC now deciding on the case. No. The, 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 uh, the countries that have taken obligations under the Geneva Conventions as well as under the Rome Statute continue to have obligations to investiga investigate um, violations, gross violations of international law, particularly under the Geneva Conventions, but we can also include others. For example, uh, the Commission of the Acts of Torture that are obviously included in the, R in the ICC, but they will be uh, criminalized and should be uh, subject to investigation and prosecution under the Convention Against Torture, regardless whether the person uh, has committed, in this case, you know, the Israeli officials who 
have committed these acts of torture and cruel and inhumane degrading treatment uh, reside in that country. The, fact, the mere fact that they will be visiting and there will be uh, no showing of credible investigation. That leads me to the issue of credible investigations in Israel. Um, I did my law degree in uh, Tel Aviv University, practiced law in Israel for about five years. Follow, try as much as I can to follow Israeli law development, particularly in this area, very closely. And I think there is a consensus, at least by uh, uh, the human rights community, the human rights organizations, who looked at the internal investigation system of the uh, a judge, a general advocate, judge, general advocate uh, of the JAGs in Israel, that and found that is lacking impartiality, it's lacking independence, its investigations are not thorough, neither uh, serious uh, as far as uh, the, the the last cases that were brought to the attention of the 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 JAG, to the extent that the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem refused to refer cases, which were they, they used, used to, to do on a regular basis, because they stopped believing that they could actually provide justice. Uh, there is a command influence. The system is, does not uh, provide, it does not meet the universal standards of impartiality, uh, and certainly not credible to, and I think that goes to, and that will be an issue that will be decided by the court, as you said, and I totally agree with that. But I don't think that will be a very difficult one. I mean, the last one that was examined, the last cases that were examined before the last invasion of the cast led, the one criminal prosecution was of a credit card theft. Uh, now, I mean, you may say, well, well, that is, that's what they, that they came back with. Um, this was also uh, the subject of the Turkle Commission. I think what is interesting about the dynamic with having the ICC is now a player in as far as the, the uh, addressing international justice issues with regard to Palestine is that it forces Israel to improve its system. And Israel, all over the years, whenever you had, uh, had committed serious uh, crimes under international law, had always uh, created an internal system in order to deflect from international responsibility. Sabra and Shatila is a great example of that. When Sabra and Shatila happened, there was a, you, there was a, there was a secu I believe there was a Security Council resolution, if not on the issue, that looked at the massacre itself. And because of the international pressure, Israel had to create the Kahan uh, Commission of Inquiry with with Chief Justice Barak, who later became Chief Justice, was sitting as a member of the commission, and found at the time that Israel, Israeli Minister of Defense has indirect responsibility towards the, uh, the, 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 the massacre of Palestinian refugees without taking uh, criminal, uh, without initiating any criminal proceedings after that. But it, it created some sort of an internal accountability. Um, I would go even, uh, and, and that happens almost on a regular basis, meaning every time you have uh, a conflict, then there's international uh, pressure, and the Israelis, Israel has to create some sort of a process in order to address that issue. Not always with the intention to seek the right conclusion as far as improving the system, hold p people accountable. Uh, for example, in the, uh, the, the one that was, the commission that was, uh, uh, created after the, the war in Lebanon in 2006 was really about lessons learned from f military intelligence failure. More than it's about war crimes committed in, in South Lebanon or in Beirut. So I think there is this kind of looking at, uh, the, the looking internally, not necessarily to hold um, them accountable. And let's just be uh, very clear. As far as the complementarity of, of the ICC, uh, Israel will have to prove that they, it has done good faith investigations. Uh, one, uh, that the purpose was not to shield those from criminal responsibility, or 
that the un if there was a delay in, in those proceedings, the unjustified delay in the proceedings, which in the circumstances is inconsistent with the intent of bringing people to justice, or the proceedings are not conducted in, in an impartial uh, or um, uh, independent way. And I think there will be a problem with doing that. Uh, just quickly to touch on the issue of uh, gravity. Uh, I think that you are right. This will be an issue that will be, it's not, it's not about Palestine. I think it is a matter of the court has to make a decision independently about whether the gravity threshold will be met. And I think that, uh, I, I, I totally agree that it has to be uh, 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 confidence in the court and in the and the prosecutor and in the court uh, ultimately to decide uh, to to make those determinations. But I think the the last thing I will want to say is the which is an important factor. Um, I, I I really don't think it's going to be easy for the prosecutor to to second guess or to overturn the decision of the general assembly on the question of Palestine, whether it's Palestine is a state or not. It's, I, I do think that this is going to be a very hard thing, in, especially when 77 uh, of the 120 members of the ICC voted uh, in favor of that decision. Uh, I think there will be other more difficult questions. Obviously, the territorial question is going to be an issue. Uh, uh, and I think here I just want to correct you know, the Supreme Court the case that is pending. I don't think that there is uh, a dispute that the United States is not uh, disputing that East Jerusalem is occupied territory. It is whether Jerusalem would be considered as a capital of Israel uh, as far as the United States foreign policy. I don't think that there is a, there's a I think that Australia raised, uh, I heard some, something that in recently, Australia had raised something about uh, contesting that East Jerusalem is not an occupied territory, but I just wanted to to put that clear. <coughs> Lastly, I think, I think people really have to, to think about the deterrence factor and the new, new dynamic and the framework that the ICC is providing. Uh, not, not only Israel and Palestine has a stake in it. As, as mentioned in the, in the flotillas case, uh, other, other countries can refer cases. There's a creation of responsibility and sending the right message to, uh, to people who are uh, who in the future, I mean, of course they will be contesting the jurisdiction for the last uh, operation in Gaza and whether the date and so forth. But if, you, if we put that aside, and it's really hard to put that aside because these are grave, grave violations and, and human rights violations. Uh, and I think that there will be a cost for both and a responsibility for both parties, meaning for the Palestinians and the Israelis. It is not an easy thing to accept that a, a, a liberation movement, the PLO, uh, and also other uh, parts of where not part of the PLO, like Hamas, agreeing to go to the ICC. I think that in of itself is an important message. The question is whether the international community will build on that, not to leave everything on the, in the door of the court and to decide what the matter is, but to say, yes, accountability for human rights should be at the center of any resolution of the, of the conflict. The court has a role to play in those cases that will be determined uh, uh, jur jurisdictional. However, we as an international community do not, uh, would not take away responsibility for that. And I will close here, thank you. Okay, some last thoughts. I know the hour is late, <clears throat> so I will speak as briefly as I can. Um, what I wanted to do was contextualize a little bit uh, the Palestinian Authority's decision to accede to the, um, to the ICC um, and offer some thoughts about what that might mean, both legally and politically. Um, so I have four, four ideas. Um, uh, so, so first is how might we understand the meaning of this secession at this time? Um, uh, the Israelis have been pretty clear that they're, um, they're not thrilled with the idea. And indeed, they take it as an act of aggression that violates um, whatever regional principles might be at work to achieve peace through other means 
um, through, through negotiated peace. And they see the, the Palestinians um, turn to the International Criminal Court as yet another sign of the bad faith of the Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority to negotiate a peace agreement. So what, is, what might we take from that position, that perspective on the part of the, uh, of the Israelis? And by the Israelis, I mean the Israeli government, not as the Israeli people. Um, first of all, when the peace negotiations that were um, brokered or attempted to be brokered by the US or by Tony Blair or by the Quartet or whoever the many actors are in that region, um, whatever they are, they are extra legal means, non-legal means, of resolving claims to territory, claims to, to, to nationhood, claims to statehood, claims of belonging, dispossession, identity, um, complex ideas in the context of Israel-Palestine, but they are extra legal means and political means. Acceding to the ICC and inviting the court to investigate the possibility of war crimes in that territory committed by either Israel or Palestine um, uh, or the Israeli government or the Palestinian actors um, is turning to law as an alternative to politics, is turning to law at a moment of failure of politics. In effect, what the Palestinian Authority has is, is decided to do as a tactical matter in the, large, in the service of a larger strategic goal of achieving statehood and sovereignty is entirely legal. And I would add, entirely peaceful. So when the negotiations failed, and when the war, the second war in Gaza, uh, uh, Protective Edge failed, um, the, as the, the Palestinians had some choices. They could respond violently. They could, again, turn to violence to, re to um, resist the occupation and to violence they felt that they were experiencing from the Israelis. They didn't. It's curious that they turned to law. Um, <clears throat> and I think we could, it's fair to say that they turned to law as a tactic, not out of a deep commitment to the integrity of law and that law will save them. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. By contrast, the Israelis, upon seeing the collapse of a negotiated peace, either led by the US and Secretary Kerry, or by others, responded by accelerating what I'll call either non-legal or illegal tactics to strengthen their position. The next day after the Palestinians filed their paperwork with the ICC, the Israelis announced that they would withhold tax remittances to the Palestinians, tax revenues that they were legally collecting on behalf of the Palestinians that were part of a negotiated um, a treaty between the Israelis and the Palestinians that's called the 1994 uh, Paris Protocol, whereby it was agreed between the Israelis and the Palestinians that Palestine would be a part, the Palestinian economy would be a part of the Israeli economy and not a separate economic entity this component, this role of the Israelis collecting Palestinian taxes was something the Israelis insisted upon because to separate and create an economic boundary between the Israelis and the Palestinians smelled a bit of sovereignty, had the flavor of sovereignty for Palestine, something the Israelis strategically, of course, would resist. So they are now withholding tax remittances, $127 million in tax remittances for December, another $100 million in tax remittances for January, and this will continue, presumably, um, uh, for some period of time. When I was just there a couple of weeks ago, it was quite cold. There was a foot of snow on the ground in Ramallah. I brought all the wrong clothes. <clears throat> Houses are not well insulated in this region. People were colder than they normally would be because the Israelis had jacked up the cost of propane. People were not able to warm their homes. Most Palestinian folks in the West Bank have these propane heaters that everyone moves around in their houses um, to keep warm and sit near to. And they were running out of, of propane because the suppliers couldn't afford to buy them anymore, the tanks, because the prices were so high. So while the rest of us in the world are benefiting from a drop in fuel prices, the Palestinians are suffering from an increase in prices that the Israelis are setting, not according to a market price, but according as a form of retaliation for the Palestinians filing with the International Criminal Court. So too, electricity is now cut off several hours a day in the West Bank on the theory 
not the theory, on the justification that the Palestinians have not been paying their electric bill. Well, the Palestinian Authority doesn't have the money to pay the electric bill <laughs> because the tax remittances are not being um, released. And then lastly, shortly after, of course, the, um, the Palestinians acceded to the ICC, the, um, the Israelis announced uh, a rather massive expansion of settlements in the West Bank, not implicitly linking the um, authorization of more settlements to the Palestinians' move relative to the ICT, ICC, but explicitly linking this move. The, the Israelis would admit that this is what they're doing. <coughs> now, some would understand these forms of response, extra legal or illegal forms of response on the part of the Israelis, as a form of collective punishment, but certainly experienced that way by Palestinians. Second point, <clears throat> the Palestinian authorities turn to law, to international law. At this moment, I find really curious. I find it actually rather odd. Um, so if we step back for a moment, maybe you'll appreciate it too. So there are many aspects of the occupation which have been held by international tribunals to violate international law already. The ICJ in 2004 found that the wall violated a number of provisions of international law. Um, uh, there's been certainly a, a, not a unanimous, but an overwhelming view that the annexation of territory um, after the 67 war was, it t was also a form of annexation of territory of another sovereign uh, people and state that violates international law. The settlements are wild, widely viewed as violating international law, um, yet international law has done nothing for the Palestinian cause. These decisions are beautiful if you agree with the Palestinian position, of course the Israelis do not, um, but the enforcement capacity of those decisions is very little, very small. So thirdly, why turn to international law at this point? Why, as a tactical matter, Rather than sticking with a political process that has failed or failing um, or turning to violence, why would the Palestinians turn to law and international law at this moment? And I ask people that when I'm there. I always do. And I think here what we're seeing is a cleaving of interest between the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people. What you're seeing in an appeal to an international body like the, EC, uh, the ICC, are acts of statecraft, are techniques of sovereignty, are the plausible performance of state identity. This is what states do. These are acts of recognition to have an inter international body recognize you as a state. This is something in which the Palestinian Authority is very invested. To what degree will the Palestinian people whether in the West Bank and Gaza, or in the diaspora, or in Israel proper, benefit from these acts of statecraft? Many people are asking this question um, within Palestine, uh, and, and I think from without, because in so many ways, the consequences and costs of these acts of statecraft are borne negatively by the people who are living in the West Bank and in Gaza. In the acts of retaliation that I've described, in the taxes, U.S. aid is threatened to be, turned, uh, to be um, uh, canceled as well. There are several bills in Congress right now to terminate USAID um, support to the Palestinian Authority as punishment, as retaliation, as the price to be paid for pursuing um, status and then a, an investigation um, at the ICC. Um, uh, the mail is not even being delivered uh, in East Jerusalem right now. So the people of the, uh, in Palestine are experiencing these acts of statecraft in a way that are quotidianly painful, whether it's that you're cold, you don't get your mail, or more importantly, um, almost 160,000 people are not being paid. The largest employer, of course, in the West Bank is the PA, is the Palestinian Authority, which does not have the taxes to pay its employees. And each one of those employees has a number of members in their family that radiates out from the particular paycheck. So it's a curious thing that they would turn to international law now, and I think one way to understand that is, that is, is to understand it as a technique of sovereignty that the PA may have as an interest, but it's not an interest necessarily shared by the people in the same way. 
So the last thing I want to say, just offer a little my random thoughts about what might happen. Uh, not from the doctrinal, with the doctrinal sophistication um, uh, uh, of some of our other panelists today, um, but more um, from an intuitive sense. It strikes me that an international body that has been accused of being racist for over or selectively prosecuting Africans will not respond to that by prosecuting Jews as their next case or prosecuting Israelis. To take this case on as the next non-African case that the court highly politicized, as I think almost any case at the ICC would be, but the next case that the ICC takes on um, doesn't repair, if you will, the sense that this is a political body. So I would be surprised if the, in, the investigation matures into the point of a prosecution um, with, uh, without avoiding or with avoiding any um, uh, continued claims of bias, racism or anti-Semitism on the part of the, uh, of the ICC or the UN system more generally. Um, if it does, if I'm wrong about this, if I'm wrong about plenty of things, and um, uh, it's, it's impossible to know, um, what's next in this region of the world. I could imagine the prosecutor giving more attention to the issues of settlements than to the, um, uh, the violence, uh, the military campaigns in Gaza. You don't have the same problems of complementarity there. You have almost no issue of complementarity there because the Israeli government is sponsoring daily um, the, uh, the expansion of settlements. It is a state project. Um, that internally has been seen as a legitimate and necessary state project. Um, and indeed, the Israeli government has taken the position in legal papers and politically that um, there is not even an occupation of the West Bank because there was no state there before to be occupied. That has been their consistent position. Um, in the case of the ICJ case uh, about the wall, which the ICJ found otherwise about, um, but they maintain this position that we're not looking at an illegal um, occupation, we're looking at something else, uh, really managing the security interests of the State of Israel. So one thing some have suggested that might be an interesting and useful tactic for the ICC to take in order to minimize charges of bi a bigotry or racism or selective enforcement that it may, it's already vulnerable to and it may continue to be so, if it singles out Israel for prosecution at this point is to pair a case having to do with the settlements in the West Bank with a case having to do with Greek Cypriots and the settlements that have been undertaken by the Turks in northern Cyprus. Here you have, as you have in the um, Palestinian context, an occupying power um, trans uh, transferring its citizens into an occupied territory um, in a systematic way both in the Turkish context or the Cypriot context and in the Israeli-Palestinian context. Um, and indeed, it might even be in the ICC's interest to move on the um, Cypriot case first. And there has been a petition to have them uh, investigate um, uh, this form of occupation as well. So um, having the court deal in a more collective way with the problem of settlement and the movement, migration, state-sponsored migration of peoples across borders um, uh, in ways that violate the Geneva Convention may itself be an interesting strategy that hews to the doctrine of the law, um, do certainly doesn't render that law political in nature. We could still do a, the courts should, could still uh, undertake a, uh, a principle, um, uh, fine reading of the jurisdictional law, other requirements of the law, but do so in a way that deflects some of the attention away from the political nature of the particular case of Israel-Palestine. So we welcome your comments, your questions. I'm gonna bet you have a few for our panel, but I first of all just wanna say this has really been very, a, a really wonderful discussion, very thoughtful, and I think very um, helpful for many of us who are trying to think these issues through. So questions? First you deserve them. So. Oh. I didn't even have to pass myself the little notes on time. <clears throat> Any questions on the law, on the, the context in which this is taking place? Um, yes, sir. I've got a question for everyone, but just quickly. If you could put
push your little button by your your uh, mic there. That'd be great. Cool. Um, I've got a question for everyone, but specifically for the, the Greg. Mm -hmm. um, if the Gaza recent Gaza hostilities aren't recognised as an international conflict, what then is the territory of Gaza? Is it recognised as part of Israel? Is it just a potential state? Mm -hmm. And then following on from that, if it is recognised as part of Israel, does that then make them open to the annexation of Gaza? Jeez. One thing is certain, it's not part of Israel. <laughs> but that doesn't help much. Um, the alternative is as follows. Well, there are perhaps even two alternatives. The first is that you consider if you go along with this idea Palestine is already a state now, then of course you could extend the argument to say Gaza, even though Fatah has not really exercised any kind of effective control for many years, is part of that new state of Palestine. If you go that way, you have, as a consequence, no problem <coughs> to characterize the conflict as an international one, with the repercussions I have pointed out. But it's a difficult avenue, and none neither the uh, Palmer panel nor the ICC prosecutor in the Flotilla incident decision has gone that way. The second avenue would be to focus on <coughs> Gaza as it presents itself or presented itself factually in June 2013 with um, what you may perhaps call um, in international legal terms an effective de facto authority, Hamas. Then you could make an argument, and that's the argument that the Palmer inquiry has made without being absolutely explicit. It is for all practical purposes like a state, not the state of Palestine, but the, the de facto state uh, of Gaza, and we apply the law of international armed conflict between Israel and the Gaza Strip as governed by this de facto authority. This is certainly not the worst uh, argument possible. By the way, in, in this case, it was very beneficial for Israel because it was otherwise very doubtful whether the law of the naval blockade could have been applied because there is a question whether this figure exists in non-international armed conflict. So there it was an application to the benefit of, of Israel. The question, however, is whether in an international criminal law context, and I'm keeps, I keep stressing this, an international criminal court will be very careful <coughs> um, to apply the law progressively uh, in, in the sense of progressive development, but rather conservatively, to rest its decision on rock solid grounds. That's, I think, very important for the legitimacy of an international criminal institution which is still so fragile and so young. And here the question is whether the court would be so uh, audacious, so to speak, to apply the law of international armed conflict to an entity which is, to put it mildly, but not unquestionably a state. It has um, a kind of there is an element of an uh, application of the law by analogy, which is difficult, even more difficult in the international criminal law context. And then the, if those two avenues fail, and as I said, the ICC prosecutor in the Flotilla incident decision did not seem to be so audacious to go that way, then I think um, the only alternative that remains is to qualify these hostilities as a non-international armed conflict. But the legal consequences would be um, quite drastic, as I've pointed out, because of the different war crimes list. Can I, can I just ask a question about that? I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to follow the different strands of the reasoning here, because if you follow the route and you say that there's a de facto state of Gaza, which sounds like a different state from the state of Palestine, then it 
that's the route, then the referral made by the state of Palestine on behalf of the state of Palestine wouldn't reach that de facto state. Right. So right. You'd, lose your, you'd lose your jurisdiction under that theory. Absolutely. Right. I think the, the, the political, <coughs> political dimension, though, that would come in is that uh, in June 2014, uh, there was a unity agreement uh, between Hamas and Fatah that although it did not translate into Fatah taking over the entire Gaza Strip, and I don't think that they are arguing that, that Fatah was in, in charge of the security apparatus in Gaza, but at least as far as political uh, entity, the, the PA, or at least the, the under that agreement, it kind of consolidated both, <coughs> both the fraction of, uh, of, of Ham Hamas, which is the most dominant group in Gaza, and the one in, in West Bank under the PA. I mean, that's, that makes it, at least politically, I don't know how much that would have implications on the legal question, uh, but uh, that, that makes it a little bit at least consistent with the idea that, that, there is, that West Bank is not separated from Gaza Strip as far as one Palestinian territory. Yes. actually a panel tonight in D.C. on that very issue, which we're not at because we're here. <laughs> there's, a, there's an easy question about corporations, which is the ICC does not have jurisdiction over corporations, so it's only natural persons. So um, in principle, individuals can commit uh, crimes even if they are not themselves state actors. For example, the crime of genocide could be committed by a person who is not a state actor as such. Uh, crimes against humanity, there's a complex definition in the Rome Statute that speaks of a state or organizational policy, and so there's a big debate uh, in the ICC and among the judges of the court about how to uh, interpret that uh, uh, brand new term, state or organizational policy, and so I could refer you to some bibliography on that if you're interested, a good article by Leila Sadat in the American Journal of International Law from 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Two additional observations. So on the individuals, um, of course, um, all is correct what has been said, but perhaps one addition, it is the prosecutorial policy so far, and I do not foresee that changing, um, that the, the office will focus on those most responsible for what is considered systematic or widespread crime. So it, is, it will be very exceptional, if at all, that the ICC will take up a case against an individual soldier, be it a Hamas or an Israeli soldier, who has committed an individual isolated crime by excess, not upon superior orders. But the court will look into policies and then will try to reach up the hierarchy and focus on those um, on the top. On the time, 
no, there are no time um, limits for those proceedings. And um, I think you're very right with your, um, with your guess that these proceedings will take a very long time. And that has to do um, with this complementarity scheme mm. that I pointed out. And um, take um, a precedent, so to speak, from a comparable uh, situation. There is a preliminary examination ongoing in the case of, not the case, the situation of Colombia. This is ongoing. Not us. <laughs> Colombia. Okay. <laughs> Colombia. <laughs> Rest assured. <laughs> Colombia. For years now, not, not because of uh, bad faith or un unwillingness of the ICC to do its job, but because the ICC prosecutor is watching now for years what the Colombian um, judicial authorities are doing themselves. And uh, as you know, there is this complicated peace process uh, going there. And the court is, so to speak, watching and waiting. And um, in this situation here, it will certainly, until the court will be in a position to reach a decision on uh, complementarity, we can discuss that a little bit further. I, I'm inclined to think it is not as easy as it was suggested to say the Israeli justice system is dependent and, and impartial and so forth. It will take a while. So no clear deadlines and uh, foresee um, probably years of proceedings in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to uh, answer the question about the, uh, uh, the current situation is that there is a preliminary uh, inquiry. It's not it's an investigation. It's not a full investigation. I think uh, in the media, it kind of was presented, reported as, a, as an investigation, as a probe, you know, the way that the media will spin it. But it's a preliminary examination, and it's significantly different than an investigation. And there's also not, uh, the referral is of a situation, not uh, a particular uh, kind of violations of the, uh, of the, of the crimes uh, enumerated in the statute, meaning it, that's something that is left to the prosecutor, which I think is a good thing, uh, and, and I think <coughs> overcomes the, the, the challenge that you, you mentioned about uh, the retroactivity, that you don't want to leave the retroactivity to the, to the state party to decide which, which situations you want to refer, but at least with that context, the, the, the prosecutor has the, the, uh, the powers under the ICC statute, under the own statute, to uh, to define which crimes and to engage in in collecting, analyzing information. By the way, there is an ongoing investigation into the United States operations in Afghanistan uh, since the war started in Afghanistan uh, in 2000, uh, late 2001 to 2002, particularly looking at allegations of torture and ill-treatment in, Af in Afghanistan, which is uh, it referred to in the report, the annual report of the prosecutor. Um, and I just wanted to say that I, I didn't have a chance to, in my remarks to say that I agree that there, the settlement uh, project is, is will be likely to be more uh, less challenging, less, less daunting for the prosecutor's office, but I think it still raises some, some difficult question uh, as to the, when, 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 do you're, when you're looking at and in identifying who are the individuals that you are going to also target for the investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the settlement project is, has been going on since the, uh, Israel occupied the, uh, the West Bank. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not, and certainly in Jerusalem it raises uh, even more difficulty in looking at those situations. Oh, wow, but why don't I take a, a couple of questions, maybe three, and bundle them, because um, I see a lot of hands. So let me do th you two and then down here first. <laughs> a little bit for us, uh, yeah. So I am Brad Parker. I work with Friends of Children and National Palestine. So I think it's interesting to, to hear the different perspectives and views. These, these are issues that we're grappling with uh, at the moment. I wanted to raise a, a question about retroactivity um, because it, it seems that this is a unique situation where um, you, know, you mentioned the, the June, uh, June 13th date. Um, it's a bit arbitrary.
because of the objection, um, they can also join the court and bring that within the realm of the court. Um, and to the extent that retroactivity may be an issue in other contexts, I think in this context it's, it's mitigated a bit because you have um, international norms that are really built on IHL. The initiation of military action by the it IDF. On itself, having a treaty under siege, having a region under siege. Mm. I, don't, I don't know what international law says about it. Mm -hmm. and I think now it is considered military intervention and it's not one. Okay. Um, when it, uh, Professor Kress, do you want to begin answering any or, or addressing any or all of these comments and I'll move down the, the panel here? remarks and questions. When I spoke about retroactivity and the problem of retroactivity, um, I was not talking about the problem of retroactive application of substantive law. Because here uh, I'm in agreement with you. The whole idea of uh, the negotiation process of the ICC statute was not to write new law, but to codify custom, existing customary international law. Mm -hmm. There are controversies about some minor points, whether there are digressions or not, but I believe for my part that the ICC statute fairly loyally portrays the existing customary international law. It does not encapsulate all customary international law. I will come back uh, to that uh, when I answer your question, but those crimes which are incorporated in the ICC statute, to my 
belief with <coughs> open custom. So in that respect, this non-retroactivity principle does not apply. My point was really about um, jurisdiction, so not about the nullum crimen principle, but about a fundamental principle of legitimacy of international criminal law institutions. And this whole idea of victor's justice, of selective justice, that has to do <coughs> with, um, well, picking and choosing jurisdiction, of defining it, of selecting it according to political preferences. I'm not now talking about the Gaza case. I'm talking about a principle. It applies here, but it's of general application, my point. And I'm saying, even though in a certain instance, certain political expectations might not be met, it is important for the destiny of this institution to stick to that principle. And this principle is in conflict uh, with retroactivity. You can argue, I, I take your point, uh, that another state may respond by itself um, launching a declaration and, and hereby widening. But while this is true, you hereby, so to speak, indirectly impose a certain obligation for another state who is not state party to, to get active, to balance the jurisdiction. You can take that uh, argument, but it is, it is questionable whether it suffices to make uh, the legitimacy point. Um, your second question on complementarity, so what are the uh, standards and are there precedents? Well, the standards are not particularly clear. Article 17 gives you only a very rough <coughs> uh, idea. Um, I'm not, not even the question of a standard of proof, it was alluded to by uh, my uh, co-panelist. Not even the question of standard of proof is clear. This, it's not clear whether Israel has to prove uh, anything. This is very much in, in the emerging jurisdiction uh, an open question. You could take the opposite view and say, well, it is for the court. Uh, if, it was, if the court wants to impose, so to speak, a detrimental effect, legal effect on Israel, it's for the court to prove that Israel fails. I, I'm mm -hmm. no commenting about it, just flagging the issues. And when you talk about precedents, well, we are at a very early stage. And when I said it is the most, probably the most challenging situation for the court, then also because we do not really have precedents precisely in point. This has to do with the fact that many of the situations that are currently before the court are situations either referred by the situation country, so there was no complementarity question in the first place. The state itself wanted the ICC to get active. Mm. And then you have Security Council referrals, for example, in the case of uh, Sudan, uh, where it was really difficult to have the idea that Bashir was investigating against himself um, in his country. So again, no serious complementarity question arose. And even in the case of Kenya, or in the situation of Kenya, where it came closest to a controversial issue of comp complementarity, the legal issues that are at stake here were not really um, fully judicially tested. There's, for example, a very important question, to what extent does Israel as a non-state party has to cooperate with the court in order to make clear how independent, how impartial its proceedings are? Has Israel the obligation to hand over case files uh, for, with respect to ongoing investigation? All these questions will arise or might arise once the question of mm. uh, status is uh, decided. I'm, I only have to argue on this, on this fall. <laughs> fall back uh, opinion because I'm not so sure as, as others about this question. But if the court comes to this point, it will for the first time apply all these questions. Very briefly uh, to your question, Madam, no, there is no war crime of placing a territory under siege as such. I think the, the war, uh, so in the ICC statement, I think what comes closest to your idea is probably the war crime of starvation of civilians. This is an accepted war crime, but for um, reasons that I have always failed to understand, it has not been included in the ICC list. And what about international law? Uh, yeah, but there, the there you have 
Yeah, but what, what about the crimes against humanity uh, as far as uh, specifically looking at, in, you know, there's a inhumane, uh, you know, treatment, inhumane treatment of population. Obviously, it has to meet all the the, the definitions uh, of, of the crimes against humanity, but I think it, co it does cover a lot of acts that, uh, that would, would be uh, in this, for example, you know, you have, uh, you know, I mentioned the issue of, of, of torture, but in particular, I think the, uh, there is a, an under Article uh, 7, uh, 16, other inhumane acts. Uh, and the question is, this, this, this blockade, uh, this uh, siege has been going on, whether that would, you know, obviously it's going to be the, maybe the first, I don't know if in the ICTY it has been raised, uh, certainly the torture was raised, but not inhumane acts, other inhumane acts. And this will be again, because there are few cases that were tried before the ICC. It will be, again, this in interesting to see whether, to what extent the prosecutor would look at the whole menu of crimes uh, or that are defined under the statute, whether it's crimes against humanity and uh, war crimes. But again, it will also go back to the question of whether how do you define the conflict, because again, that, that would maybe limit the ability of the, of the, of the prosecutor to, to, uh, to at least uh, focus on certain crimes within the ICC statute. Well, gosh, there are so many things to respond to. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to begin. Um, I think I just want to um, take issue, perhaps, with um, one point that uh, Professor Kress asserted, which I think he was claiming a more or less identity between the uh, specification of the crimes in the Rome Statute itself and the parallel body of customary international law. I think I would agree with you, and you and I could sit down and we could go through line by line and match them up. But I think if you were a government deciding whether to become party to the ICC statute, you would want to do that exercise for yourself. And it might be that there are respects in which the ICC statute does go beyond the existing treaty obligations of states, both in a fuller, clearer, and more uh, exacting specification of war crimes and in a very full definition of crimes against humanity, which never existed before in treaty-based law. And so in all of those respects, this is why the principle of consent was viewed by the participants in the Rome negotiation as being fundamental. And those states, many of them anyway, including our own, wanted their own parliamentary bodies to be the ones to look at this code of crimes and decide whether this code of crimes is the same code of crimes that we can sign on to, even if it is substantively identical to the parallel body mm -hmm. of customary law. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more to say, but we're we are at the end of time. So thank you um, to our panelists for a really stimulating and thoughtful discussion. Thank you to all of you um, for coming.